Live from the studios of NBC 12 and ABC 25, this is First Coast News at 5. A sacred trust broken. First Coast News broke the story last night. Newborn babies used as props for social media posts. And tonight we are on their side, pressing the Navy for answers to the most pressing question. How in the world could anyone let this happen? We will have much more on this story coming up in just a few minutes. Hurricane Maria brought heavy rains and very strong winds overnight as this catastrophic Category 5 storm made landfall. So this is what we know right now. Forecasters are warning of the possibility of a direct hit on Puerto Rico tomorrow, and Governor Scott is already receiving briefings on this storm. Now the question still remains tonight. Where is this storm heading next? And do we need to be prepared here in Florida? For that, we turn to First Coast News storm expert Lindsay Boach with more on Maria's track. Lindsay? Right now, winds of 165 miles per hour expected to even strengthen a little bit more before it makes landfall in Puerto Rico. Uh, this is a storm that is now a Category 5. It rapidly intensified yesterday, and last night we saw it strengthen to that Category 5 status. Uh, it is possible, again, that it could strengthen again tonight and this evening before the outer eye wall becomes better defined or that cyclone reaches portions of Puerto Rico. So here's where it is right now, moving about 10 miles miles per hour. We'll zoom in here and show you exactly where this storm is, where it's expected to go. And uh, again, just basically right over Puerto Rico is where the projected path is going to be. Uh, you see the cone right here and the entire island of Puerto Rico is in that cone. Uh, so U.S. Virgin Islands expected to get hit actually already starting to see some of those outer bands of the storm uh, being hit already. So here is that eye wall. It's about um, it's a pretty strength, pretty strong eye wall actually could see some eye wall replacement. Uh, that is something that we will keep an eye on here locally. Our weather it's been dry for the past several days very little rain to talk about. Maybe a little bit of a shower up towards the airport right now. We're going to see this pattern continue over the next few days. We'll talk a little bit more about Maria's path, what we can expect here at home, if any impacts from Maria coming up in just a little bit. Outrage. That is how many parents are feeling this evening after workers at a naval hospital in Jacksonville are seeing just taunting newborn babies and then posting the photos to social media. First Coast News was the first to break this story last night, and these posts, boy, they have really created a firestorm on Facebook. The posts accusing these hospital workers of making the babies dance to music and other inappropriate gestures. And Heather, as a mother, how does this make you feel when you see these pictures? Outrage. You can't, can't even fathom why someone would do that. If that was my baby, oh my goodness, just simple outrage. And so we know that's how a lot of you are feeling out there this evening. So the hospital is responding to these images saying, quote, we are aware of a video photo posted online. It's outrageous, unacceptable, incredibly unprofessional and cannot be tolerated. We have identified the staff members involved. They have been removed from patient care and they will be handled by the legal system and military justice. So our Shelby Danielson is on your side tonight. She has the details of what kind of charges these nurses could now be facing. So she joins us live now with all the details tonight. Shelby. Well, Heather and Anthony, first I want to start off by saying that outrage word you're using. So much outrage on social media, it appears it almost has crossed the line. I spoke with families on both sides of this situation today, and they say they have both received just so many hateful messages on social media, and that includes the families of the babies involved in this video. So they're really keeping to themselves for now, but I did speak with a local attorney today to try to get some information about what kind of consequences these two women could be facing. Screenshots of babies at Naval Hospital Jacksonville now viral online with captions like how I currently feel about these mini Satans. The initial post also describes the Navy employees as moving the babies along to rap music. The story has been shared by thousands just locally, with some saying they should be thrown in jail. Others say these two women have tarnished the reputation of other corpsmen, another calling them disgusting and to lock them up. I think what's particularly egregious is the amount of media exposure this is getting. Anthony Kolink, a current law professor with a history in military legal affairs, says the attention to these posts could make the punishment even harsher. Considering especially the amount of outcry that's coming from the public against this and the embarrassment to the Navy, I'm assuming 
this qualifies pretty easily as service discrediting conduct by these two young ladies. Coling so. says there are four possible routes of punishment. Administrative discipline, like being written up. Administrative discharge, they would be fired. Captain's mast, which means they could have a dock in pay or lose rank. And then a court martial, which means they could have a criminal trial. Yet even if the parents of the babies were perfectly fine with not having uh, charges pressed, the commander might disagree and say, I still think it's you know, serious enough to warrant that. The women involved were immediately removed from patient care at the hospital. Coling says it could take weeks or months to formulate a punishment as they have to investigate their history with the Navy. Now, has this been going on further? I mean, they probably are going to want to investigate it more to find out are there other babies that they did this kind of thing to also, or was this an isolated incident? As a defense counsel, I represented a lot of young and stupid Air Force people too. Um, and, you know, young people sometimes just make really dumb decisions. And as they investigate the history of these two women, Coling says it's possible they could try to obtain a warrant to look into past social media posts to see if they posted anything else. Even though they have already deleted their accounts, they can search for anything else. Now, we have reached out to NAS Jax here and also the Navy Southeast region, but they've made it very clear that this is going to be the sole responsibility of the Naval Hospital to make any further comments. And so we're awaiting some more answers to our questions. Live at NAS Jacks, Shelby Danielson, First Coast News on your side. That is such a shocking story, Shelby. Uh, we are monitoring major breaking news out of Mexico this evening. A very powerful earthquake measuring 7.1 on the Richter scale sent thousands of people fleeing for cover today. Tonight, we know at least 42 people are dead and there are reports of many others trapped in the rubble. You can see people filling the streets in the capital city of Mexico City. Video taken shared on social media shows just scenes of complete chaos. We saw video of a skyscraper swaying back and forth. If you look closely right here, you can see people running out of the bottom floors. Another video shows people standing outside right after that earthquake struck. The camera shows people in shock as you see pieces of the building behind them start to crumble away. Moments later, that entire building lets loose and you'll see it collapse into a pile of smoky debris. Now this is one of at least, look at that. Wow. Wow, one of at least 20 buildings there in Mexico City that collapsed or suffered major damage from this earthquake. Another video, this one right here on social media, shows a several story building right there suddenly falls to the ground. Incredible, as you hear spectators scream out in horror. And this video right here shows a factory already on fire after the earthquake when a fireball just erupts into the sky. That death toll of 42, it is expected to climb. And we're going to closely monitor this. We will keep you updated throughout this newscast online and on air. Here at home, Governor Rick Scott met with leaders in Orange Park to discuss recovery efforts in Northeast Florida after Hurricane Irma. Our Hani Rodriguez joins us live with what the governor had to say. Hani. Hey, Anthony and Heather, that meeting actually wrapped up about an hour ago. And the point of that meeting was to talk about those needs that haven't yet been met. A lot of people here in Orange Park still haven't been able to make it back into their homes. And I want to show you a perfect example of that. Some video I shot earlier at Villas Continental. Those are some condos here about two blocks from where I'm standing. I don't know if we can pull up that video now, but at least, uh, you know, 100 people were had to be rescued by boats from these apart uh, from these condos. Rather, as you can see, the damage there was catastrophic, leaving behind almost just the shell of those condos there, uh, condos there. Governor Scott knows that there is work left to be done, and he promised people here in Orange Park that something will get done. Everybody needs their power back. Everybody needs to make sure they have water, sewer, um, and then we've got a big uh, claims adjust adjustment process that we're going to be going around the state. Something else he brought up at today's meeting was uh, the issue of Zika. He's telling people that if they have any standing water near their business or home, to try to do the best they can to get rid of that again for Zika purposes. He also wants to remind people we still have about two months left of hurricane season, so be prepared and have a plan. For now, reporting live in Orange Park, I'm Hani Rodriguez, First Coast News on your side. Thank you, Hani. Well, the JEA says power has now been restored to almost all of its customers, and now they're in the process of assessing the damage for Hurricane Irma to its infrastructure. Early assessment is that the storm damage to the system is about $30 million. 
On your side's Ken Amaro has more now on the JEA's report to its board of directors today. Ken? That's correct, Heather. The last seven days has been grueling for the JEA. Today, JEA CEO Paul McElroy told his board that the utility was more prepared for Irma than it was for Matthew a year ago. Even so, there were some problems, and now they're trying to take those problems and make them a learning lesson as they plan and prepare for the next storm. The JEA reports during Irma, 850 way stations failed. 30 of their generators at the lift stations had to be repaired on the spot. There were also five main water breaks and about 280,000 electric customers lost their power. The storm also destroyed 16 transmission lines. And as you stated, the financial impact is estimated at $30 million. Alan Howard is chairman of the board and he said that the JA early planning proved to be successful. While there were still some, uh, sewage outflows and, and one is too many. Uh, we were far more successful in managing that with uh, both tethered uh, and new uh, power generation facilities associated with each of those lift stations. So I think uh, less than half as many power failures at our lift stations with uh, Irma as we had with Matthew. So yes, yeah, successful. Now Howard says they will continue to work on its plan to minimize flooding at the lift stations. However, Mayor Lenny Curry, who attended the meeting and congratulated the JA on its hard work and its success, was very critical of the utility's communications with its customers. So tonight, coming up at 6, we'll hear what the mayor had to say and what he expects going forward. Back to you. Ken Amaro on your side. Thank you, Ken. Flagler County deputies are investigating a homicide after a man was found lying in his driveway. Deputies responded around 4 this morning to a home on Parkview Drive that's in Palm Coast. The man was taken to Halifax Hospital in Daytona Beach where he died. Deputies say there is not a threat to anyone else in the area, but they are actively investigating the situation. So if you have any information about this man's death, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers. That phone number 877-277-TIPS. JSO was investigating after a man fell off the McGirt's Creek Bridge early this morning and died. Police say they were contacted after two this morning about a man who fell over that bridge into McGirt's Creek. That's near Blanding Boulevard in Argyle Forest. JSO divers were called to assist and they located the man's body a short time later. We're told foul play is not suspected in this case. The state attorney's office says it will not file charges against a JSO officer who shot and killed an African-American man last year. Investigators now say Officer Tyler Landerville was justified in shooting Vernell Bing in the head after a car chase in May of 2016. Police reports say Bing was found in a car officers had been looking for in connection with a shooting that April. Bing ran from police and crashed into an officer's car in Springfield, but some witnesses say he was walking away from the officers when he was shot. A terrifying sight for one Florida man after he witnessed an alligator attack his neighbor's dog. The quick actions he took to save that dog coming up. And scary moments as a sinkhole swallowed part of a home and the homeowner watched the whole thing happen. We'll have more after the break. Wow, can't imagine watching that. All right, taking a look at Hurricane Maria. We'll zoom in closer to the track, where it's expected to go and how it could impact us. Coming up after the break.